Right, well, very nice to be here again. So this is the second lecture where um, we'll talk about filling the gaps. So we talked about historical data and how to annotate that, but there's also the issue that sometimes we just don't have enough historical data. And if we don't have enough historical data, then one way um, we could take to resolve that is to actually try and do some field work on uh, modern spoken varieties of the historical language we're working with. So this lecture will be about that. Um, so we're basically getting more fieldwork data. Now, um, it all comes back to that question, how can we gain insight in historical linguistics if we don't have recordings? And that was the historical linguistic challenge that I presented to you with two weeks ago. And I had the nice mountain climbing analogy here, which I'll keep on following this um, during this lecture, just to be consistent. So the idea was, how do we get that overview from the top? How do we get to a place where we can really get good insight into the history of specific languages, into the history of written sources or historical sources or history in general? And how can we learn more about facts? Um, about language in general. So we started climbing from the valley two weeks ago, and then basically we noticed that the more you annotate your data, uh, the higher you get and the more you can actually see and learn about this. And then we sort of got stuck halfway because we did everything we could and we rested in this nice little hut. But um, at some point, maybe you just don't have more historical data. So that's what we will pick up now. So how can we get more data? Well, we get a guide to do fieldwork. Now, even um, with fieldwork, even though it's to do with modern languages, there is actually some uh, dangers as well. So um, it can be difficult to do fieldwork. It can be very expensive to do fieldwork. It can be very time consuming to do fieldwork. And again, actually, sadly, that is a part of our job that is very underestimated and often also just sort of assumed, but not really taught or explained very well. There's very few, let's say, full-time professors of fieldwork, linguistic fieldwork anywhere in the world. Um, so um, this is very often just sort of, oh yes, and then you go on fieldwork, you get your data and you come back and you analyze it. And we all focus on the analysis part. So for this lecture, I don't want to focus on the analysis part at all. I'm just going to focus on the step-by-step, -step, how do you do field work bit. Um, so we're talking about the how, what, and where of linguistic field work specifically. And I have to warn you, this is only one hour. So this is not going to be a comprehensive overview at all because there are so many things um, that are relevant in field work. So I'm going to try and give you a snapshot of every step, but there's a lot more and we can talk about that um, in a couple of weeks when I'm in Ghent or we can talk about it in the question period. So let's start with where. I'll just divide it into two things now, um, into either online or actually in the field, because you can do linguistic field work online these days. Um, and it has to do with different degrees of how you structure your field work as well. And, I'll have some references up on the slides. Um, so if you do online field work, you can use, let's say, all sorts of survey, survey um, websites like Lime Survey, SurveyMonkey, Google Forms, Qualtrics. Some of these you have to pay for, but the university may have a subscription to them. They have slightly different options. Um, some of them are completely free. Um, some of them allow for audio files, etc. So there's a lot of ways you can collect data basically online. Um, so those would be mainly survey types of data collection. You can also do other types of data collection. For instance, you can design a special app that actually asks you, where are you from? But maybe not literally, but um, the uh, English dialect app that um, uh, Adrian Lehmann and other people here in Cambridge have made for their project um, basically lets people talk to their phone, pronounce certain things, and then it guesses their dialect and it has some questions about what would you say for and it comes up, there's a picture that comes up, etc. And then based on the answers, at the end, 
it guesses, well, maybe you're from Liverpool. Is this correct? And it asks you if it's correct or not. And if it's correct, you say yes. And um, if it's not correct, no. And then you can say where you actually are from and you can talk, tell a bit more about your background, et cetera, if you decide to give that information freely. And um, then they can use, the researchers can use this data um, in, for whatever way they choose. And of course, then you can be very specific with whatever research question you have. Now you can also have this for, um, so in Welsh, there's an app that <laughs> literally is say something in Welsh, and um, it, it does very similar things. It tags on to the, let's say, general popularity these days of, oh, my dialect is precious. So um, it's trying to make sure that oh, in my dialect, you say this for this particular word and then you pronounce it, et cetera. And this has given people who work on modern Welsh a lot of new data. So of course, um, this is not something that you can just sort of take off the shelf. This actually requires a lot of development, but once you have it, you can do a lot with it. So it's another form of online, let's say data collection. And then more recently, especially due to the pandemic, a lot of the traditional fieldwork has moved from interviews, let's say, in the field in some remote forest to um, Zoom or Skype recordings, because even in remote areas, internet has now reached further and further. And sometimes it is actually possible to, let's say, do your linguistic interview through Zoom or through Skype. So um, these things. Um, and then, of course, there's ways of doing that. And there's advantages and disadvantages. You can record Zoom meetings, as we all know, but the quality may not be as good as you um, would do it in other ways. But there's advantages and disadvantages. You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of pounds to travel somewhere. So how do you decide what you want to do? Well, again, you need to ask, what is the purpose of either my paper, my project, other historical linguists that might use this or other linguists in general that might use my data, et cetera. Um, we go back to our research questions and do they even allow for online options? And um, when it comes to um, deciding to go to the field, do you actually have enough time and enough money to go to the field? Because these are important questions before you leave. And I'll get back to that. So that was the where of linguistic field work. Um, now I'd like to go into the what of linguistic fieldwork. Um, focusing first of all on what is my purpose. So um, is the purpose to document the language? And this is often the case for especially endangered languages that have no written, um, written data at all. Um, that haven't been documented, nobody's ever been to the place, talked to the people, written about the language, etc. cetera. Um, in that case, it might be worthwhile, first of all, to document the language before you start actually asking complicated questions about egophoricity in the language. Um, another purpose could be to indeed extend our historical language depth. So this is one of the purposes of our project, because we have a lot of Old and Classical Tibetan, for instance, as I mentioned, and we do now want to know um, how did Classical Tibetan evolve into all the modern Tibetan languages that we have, because there is a lot of them. And this is not unlike what's been done with other projects. So again, people like David Willis and others have done similar things developing dialect atlases of Welsh. Um, people have done similar things with dialect atlases in, um, in the Netherlands. So sometimes this is actually useful because in dialect atlases, you can see, let's say, variation that might go back to historical variation. Um, so that could be your purpose. Your purpose could also be to describe a specific language variety very often something that comes after the documentation or goes alongside documentation. And um, then finally, you could, you could have a specific research question that you need to answer. Um, so there's different types of, um, different purposes to doing linguistic fieldwork. And it's good to be aware of what your purpose is before you go. So again, just looking ahead at what my purpose was, well, one of the purposes I had with my project is that I wanted to learn more about egophoricity. 
So going back to these, um, these points here, we have a specific research question, but we also have varieties that are not described yet at all. So we do need to describe them at least to the extent that we can answer that specific question. Um, but these languages are also not documented. So uh, sometimes you can have, um, because of your research question, you're actually going to have to do all four of these. And again, it's good to be aware of that because it's, um, it's a lot more work to focus on all four of these. Right, so our question was how to find basically this conscious self and how did that change? Um, because the morphosyntax, as you remember well, was actually present in earlier stages of the language, but with a different function. So we expect, let's say, to find people in the wild speaking this um, or pronouncing this egophoricity, um, but um, we don't know exactly how and why, etc. So we're trying to fill the gaps with new modern data, and we do that with Zarzonke. I'm going to have some examples of that. That's the language I documented this summer, um, also called South Mustang Tibetan, so SMT, this D abbreviation. And um, my colleague, uh, Alexander O'Neill, is currently in um, Kathmandu to collect data on modern varieties of Newar, um, Lalipur Newar, but he just actually contacted me this afternoon to say that he found speakers of Dolakan Newar and he found some speakers of other varieties and he couldn't understand anything. So that's going to be a nice new addition to it. And we didn't know how different they were. So that's going to be another part. And then there is a point K, which is a teacher on Tibetan variety that I'd like to document. Um, well, hopefully next year or the year after, because they have some um, interesting questions. Um, hopefully answers to our question. Um, I'll talk about um, automatic speech recognition for low resource languages a bit today and um, word segmentation. So that was the what of linguistic field work. And now we move on to the how of linguistic field work. Now this is going to take a little bit longer as you can imagine. Um, so there's actually three hows, I would say. And all three of these are very important, even though most of the time people think about just preparing the how to work in the field bit. But actually the preparation is extremely important. And the more you prepare, even though everything goes differently when you're there, um, the more you prepare, the better your results. And uh, yeah, this, so this is really important. And I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, I'm also going to spend time on how to use and save the fieldwork data. So you, it's not just about doing the actual recording. There's a lot of work that comes after that. So I'm going to talk about all three of these phases and show you some examples. So first step, how to prepare. Um, I've divided this into different sections and they'll come back in the second and third steps as well. So uh, first I'm going to basically give you a quite boring, but very, very important practical preparation uh, step. And this is about travel, where you stay, about money, about forms, about health, etc. So let's look at these one by one. Um, how are you going to travel and where will you stay? So we're getting back to our decision making process here. And you need to ask yourself, but not just yourself, I would say, I would say, especially if you go to a place like Nepal or any other place. Um, so I've also done field work in Wales, for example, and I've also done field work in Holland. Um, and of course, you need different things if you go into your own country. It's completely different. So I'm going to just focus on the extreme case where you go to a very remote area of Nepal because. It, once you know that, you can cover all the other places as well. It will make it a lot easier. Um, so if you go to a place where you've never been, especially, you don't just ask yourself, but you also ask your colleagues um, who may have been there, and not just colleagues in linguistics, but anyone, you know, anthropologists, um, anyone who's who may have been to that area, maybe locals, before I actually started doing fieldwork in Nepal, 
I'd been doing volunteer work in Nepal for a long time and I've been working a lot with people. And without those connections, I could have never done my first fieldwork trip. So I think it's very important to not just ask yourself where you, how you travel, where you stay, but to work with people who know. Um, and then you can ask what the options are. So obviously when you go to a place like Nepal, you're going to have to fly there, which is not my favorite mode of transport, but there is no other option. Um, so you can't take a train, you have to fly. Um, now, once you get there, there are options. Are you going to do um, another flight to get you to a remote area? Or um, are you going to take the bus to that remote area? Or are you, well, there's no trains in that part of Nepal, so that is not even an option. And then the question is, are you going to take private transport or public transport? Um, and a lot of the, um, a lot of these things are important to think about beforehand because they have very different prices attached to them. And you need to put those prices in your grant application. So you can't do with just saying, I'll go there. You have to actually work all the details out beforehand. Um, and I think a lot of the answers will come from a balance with how much time and money you have, um, how safe things are, um, you know, um, how environmentally friendly do you want to be? And um, that is always my preferred option, but basically you have no choice in Nepal for any of that. So I've left that out here because it was not even part of, not a variable I could take into account. Um, but what is safe is very important. And um, uh, one example, um, very concrete example that I have from uh, this summer is that we were planning on taking a private jeep for an, our entire team to a very remote area um, because that was the cheapest option it took one day but for a whole team we thought okay we could rent a private jeep and we could take all of our equipment um, and that would be safer than spending let's say you know, two days on a bus and risking like damaging all our equipment etc um but then it turned out that there was a landslide on the way and basically we got stuck in some place and there was no way we were going to get to the area. So the only option we had was to rent a helicopter. Now, obviously that is completely different from what we had in our budget. So um, it's very different price tag <laughs> to it, but it was the only way um, because it would not have been safe to go through the place where there's a landslide. And I think, that that is a very important consideration. You just, you, you have to make decisions about your safety first and put your safety first. Um, so yes, um, no matter how exciting it was to take a helicopter, <laughs> I did have to pay for it myself. Um, but I think these things are important to try and sort of, you try and mitigate this as much as possible. Um, but sometimes there are unforeseen things like landslides. And even though we had avoided the rain season, Apparently, it still happened. So there are some things you can plan, but some things um, are still going to be difficult. So the time and money factor come in here because, yes, the helicopter only took us 20 minutes and it would have taken us, let's say, two days on a bus and it would have taken us eight hours by Jeep. So there's very different time frames connected to all of these options. Um, then in terms of travel and stay, um, what is the impact on the community? Like one thing that was good about us spending all that money on a helicopter is that we could pay a local helicopter company and make them very rich and happy. And of course we had to cancel our Jeep. So our Jeep company was not very happy, but all of these things affect communities, especially communities that are not very rich. Um, what is the travel advice? So one thing I would definitely recommend if you go to any foreign country, regularly is to subscribe to your foreign office travel advice. And this is very important because if the travel advice is negative, or even if it's like orange, which in the UK at least is sort of between it's green and um, red, there's sort of an orange yellow shade where there's sort of a semi warning. Um, that means that, for instance, your travel insurance won't cover you if something goes wrong. So you do, because uh, they only look at the 
foreign office advice. So you do need to look at the travel advice. So the easiest way is to sign up for travel alerts from your government. So wherever country you're in, sign up for that because your insurance will be linked to that. And you just have to know. And then of course you have to think about your visas, your permits. Um, so visa to enter the country, um, passports that are um, at least you know, six months after you travel, um, after you come back that are still valid. Uh, permits for special restricted areas to restrict the area I went to for field work this summer. Um, doesn't really allow foreigners. If you want to go, you have to have a special permit you have to pay $50 per day and you need to stay there with one of their local guides for at least 10 days. So that's $500 added to your budget just for being 10 days in the area where you want to talk to people. So that is putting a lot of strain on your budget, obviously. And um, because we couldn't afford to stay in that area for an entire month, um, one thing we did to get out of that is um, we stayed at the edge of the area for a while and talked to people who had migrated and from villages around it, who also spoke the language. And then we went in for 10 days and did a lot of work in those 10 days. And then we went out again and um, talked to the people around the area again. So this is a way um, to get around these things. And it's important to, to sort of be aware of that and plan in advance. Um, now, where do you stay? There's options, of course, especially if you go to remote villages, there might be fewer options, but one option is to stay with local families. And that has some advantages. For instance, it means that you get easy access to speakers of the language most of the time. Um, because you live with them. And it might also mean that, you know, you create a sort of a special friendship with them, hopefully. Um, and that means you get easier access to a lot of data and you have many learning opportunities. So you can actually learn the language that you're working with, with which most of the time people appreciate as well. Also, it's very often a more affordable option. Usually, of course, you would give people money for staying in one of their rooms or wherever you're staying. Um, but you would give them money for food and boarding and um, that would, you know, help help them as well. So those are advantages. Um, disadvantages, of course, as I said, um, you often give them some money, let's say, because you stay with them. But then maybe there's like, say, 10 villages or 10 families in your village. And then you stay with one family and they're getting all your income. So that sound, doesn't really sound fair to the neighbors who are not getting all this extra income and who also wanted to host you. So you have to think really carefully about what is appropriate in the community. And if other people are not going to think that, you know, you're being unfair because, or this family, maybe they won't tell you, but they might now find that one family that you're staying with is getting an unfair advantage in the village because no one has any income, but they're suddenly just hosting you and talking and suddenly getting rich because of that. So obviously um, the alternative is then that you stay with all 10 families for you know, one week or for a couple of days, but that is very often difficult to arrange. So um, sometimes this is not an issue at all, but you do need to understand a bit more about the community before you decide to stay with people. Um, it also means that you, if you stay with a family, you most of the time have no privacy. There's also no alone time. And this is quite important because most human beings at some point do require a little bit of alone time. And especially if you're trying to do difficult work, it's good to have a moment to just sit and think. And when you're staying as a guest with other people for a longer period of time, you sort of feel like you're always switched on. And this can actually be a bit difficult. Um, it can also just be practically like less comfortable. A couple of years ago, I stayed in a very nice remote village, um, but uh, they had told me there were no mosquitoes, but it was full of mosquitoes, but there were no mosquito nets of any time, kind. So before I knew it, I was completely covered in mosquito bites because mosquitoes love me. And um, that was, it was very, very uncomfortable and painful and there was nothing I could do about it, but it was all to do with the fact that I stayed in a place where, you know, there was, very, there was nothing. Um, and 
at some point, of course, it can get a little bit extreme because there could be safety risks involved. Um, I have also stayed in places where there were enormous snakes just sort of crawling around and um, under my bed, in my bed. And yeah, you have to mitigate these risks before you decide um, to stay with, uh, yeah, in a sort of, in an affordable um, with local family place. Because for the local people, the risks might not be the same. And I think that is important to realize. Um, for instance, the very simple example of the mosquitoes, um, they're apparently resistant to those. So it was just me, the weird white foreigner who got bitten all over her face. So yes. <laughs> um, sometimes you don't have an alternative. The village where I stayed, there was no hotel. There was not even a guest house. There was no option to pitch a tent. So, you know, sometimes you don't have the option of staying anywhere else. So you have to make the most of what you get. And sometimes it means actually um, what my colleague has done in the past in one of the villages that we visited last summer is stay in a different village because there is a little guest house and then just walk every day to the village to collect your data to make sure that you sort of obviate all these uh, disadvantages. And yes, it will take more time, but you'll have to think about these and weigh, weigh the pros and cons, really. Um, so it brings us to budgets and money and planning for this. Um, an important thing is to always keep on updating your budget. <laughs> um, knowing the limits of your budget is very important. Um, and um, also knowing if you get a grant, very often you have a certain amount of money that is allocated to travel and a certain amount of money that is allocated to, let's say, paying informants and a certain amount of money for food, etc. And these posts are not always interchangeable. Or let's say maybe you can change, but up to a thousand pounds. And this is very important. You need to know exactly how much money you have at all times. And if there's a possibility to change things, because things will change. So you need to know in advance what will work. You also just need to do very practical things, like make sure that your bank cards are working abroad and every country has different rules for that and every card has different rules for it. And it changes regularly as well. So check with your bank if you maybe need to tick a box to say I'm away because otherwise there's a fraud alert, which happens a lot these days. Save the emergency details of your bank somewhere in your phone, but also on a laminated card that you bring with you. Always bring um, a $20 or maybe if you have a little bit more money, a $50 banknote with you wherever you travel in the world, because it means if you get stuck, you can get a taxi to go to safety because most countries in the world will accept dollars, US dollars. So always have that with you. Um, it's just a safety thing. And then um, in advance, try and find out what the cheapest ways are of getting local money. So for me, it's Nepali rupees. Um, there's various ways of getting Nepali rupees. You can start um, here in the UK, for instance, and exchange them. Um, but you can also just get them from an ATM when you're in Kathmandu. But there's various costs for all of these things and conversion costs. And that makes a huge difference these days. So check what the cheapest way is of getting a lot of money. And also always make sure that you have a lot more money in your bank account than you actually need. Um, because sometimes maybe you do need to have make the decision to pay for that helicopter right here, right now. And that's $1,500 gone immediately. So you need to be prepared for that and then see later on if you can get that back. Um, that brings me to some other boring bits that I'll go through a bit quicker forms. Um, so there's a lot of forms that you will need to prepare and bring. So you need to talk about, we'll talk about ethics in a bit, but you need to um, basically make sure that you have all of these forms in multiple languages, preferably. So in my case, that would be in English and in Nepali, definitely in English because my employer likes that, but also in Nepali because people in Nepal tend to read that a lot better. Um, consent forms, payment receipt forms, etc., ethics forms. Make sure that everything is approved beforehand by your university, signed off, and 
bring it in printed forms. Um, print your grant application or your project description because people can ask. And sometimes you can get in a situation, which I have had before, that people wonder, well, what are you researching? And do you have any credentials? And um, they will basically make you pay for anything. And if you then can't show that you're actually part of a project, it's a problem. So bring that in printed form. Um, check if you need to fill in a form to get some sort of permission to do research in what area you, whatever area you're going to do your research in. Um, and then bring that form as well. And get good insurance and bring a printed version of your policy, plus the emergency contact details, of course. Um, so that was a bit boring. And the health bit is also a bit boring, but not less important. So get vaccinations, because in places like Nepal, they don't have, like, you can be brought to the emergency room, but you might not be able to get the treatment that you need because they don't have it in Kathmandu and you have to fly to New Delhi and that lose, you lose a day. So some things you just need to be, um, be very careful about. So get your travel vaccinations if you can. Um, do some sort of general health check, including dental check before you go, especially if you go for a longer period of time. Um, Get malaria pills if you uh, go to an area where that's relevant. Um, check the side effects. Never take malarium, for instance, because even though it's very useful to um, only take malaria pills every week instead of every day, it's like mararon you have to take every day, and larium you have to take once a week, but it gives you all sorts of schizophrenic side effects. So that's not what you want to have, some mental health um, uh, trauma while you're doing field work. Um, do additional COVID checks before you go to the remote area because you don't want to bring COVID or whatever infectious disease you may carry into your community and then let's say, oh, all the 80-year-old speakers that are left in this beautiful village are now infected with COVID and, you know, that would be a disaster, of course. So, after traveling, like after the flight and everything, do additional checks so you don't bring, you're not the cause of a health crisis. And if you have um, a long-term uh, chronic illness, for instance, um, then make sure that you get any doctor's notes for prescribed drugs and bring a lot more than you need because um, doctor's notes are really necessary. Um, so whenever I travel to Nepal because I have a chronic illness, I need to take certain medication and I need to bring an official letter from my GP because otherwise I very much look like a drug dealer with my big bag of extra medication. Always put it in your hand luggage as well, obviously. Right. That leaves us with technical preparation. So we've got a lot of the practical stuff out of the way. Now, technical preparation is about equipment, testing, training. So for equipment, um, again, you can ask yourself, but also colleagues and locals. Um, so what kind of data do you need? Do you need just audio recordings or also video recordings? And what types of microphones are there and what types um, are available to me, et cetera? Could you get access to computers there or do you need to bring your own? Could you get access to recorders there or do you need to bring your own, et cetera? Um, do you know how to work with all of this equipment? There's a lot of technical stuff that I had never heard of before I went to do field work, and I just needed to do some training courses on how to do all of this. Um, test if you're bringing equipment, if everything is working well before you bring it into a remote area. And also know what do you do if things break? Like, can you fix them yourselves? yourself? Can you ask someone? Are there alternatives? Um, and a very big one, <laughs> what about electricity? So. Um, this time in the summer, it was no problem for me because they had electricity in the village where I went. But three years ago, um, no, four years ago, when I went to Dolpo, there was no electricity. So I had to bring solar panels. But if you bring solar panels, you cannot bring a MacBook, for instance, because they cannot be charged by solar panels um, because they require uh, different types of chargers. So that means that I have to get another laptop. Well, all of these things you have to really think about very carefully in advance. Also, what do you do if the sun doesn't shine? And that happens. So for me, it meant that at some point I had to walk for three days back to another village. And then I wanted to charge everything because there was not enough sun. 
And then when I finally got back to that other village, um, it turned out that that village didn't have electricity either because they're on a rota and it turned, looked, turned, it looked like a week before they, it was their turn to have electricity again. So I had to delay everything. So bring um, extra batteries if you can and adapters for any type. Um, and yes, try and find out uh, what, what you need. And then, of course, the question, how can you bring it all? Can you bring it all? Do you maybe need extra people to carry this? I would definitely recommend that. The first time I did field work in Nepal, I didn't bring extra people. And I had two enormous bags, one with equipment and one with just, you know, survival things like sleeping bags. And it was a lot to carry in a place where there's no Jeeps. So um, bring a very useful sort of compact equipment bag if you can, or more people. Now, the audio versus video question, of course, the audio, if you just do audio, it's very cheap and easy um, because you can just get your audio recorder and it's easy and it's also more subtle because you can do recordings. Um, even if people know that there's an audio recording because you ask for their consent, you can sort of just do it. But um, the disadvantages are that you can't actually see what people are doing. There are no gestures or signs. It's also difficult to transcribe, especially if you have groups. And there's no additional backup. If you do video and audio, then at least you have two if one of them fails. So um, usually I go for video, um, but it depends a bit. If they really find it difficult to um, sit in front of a camera, um, and a lot of people find it difficult to sit in front of a camera, then maybe audio is your best option. So, Types of audio devices, well, it depends what type of research you do. You don't want to have, let's say, lossless um, audio. So lossless means that, um, so, well, you want to have lossless, so no loss of quality. So uh, uh, recorders that do WAV format are good, but if they only do MP3 format, then you lose a lot of audio quality. So that's not really useful. Now, of course, for instance, if you do syntactic research, um, then maybe you think that you don't really need that high quality audio. But then if I'm the first person to go into this community and document the language, then maybe other people will want to use it. And maybe some of those people are phoneticians. So I might as well bring a recorder and do it once and do it right. So there's other things to consider there as well. And then of course, finally, there's the linguistic preparation. Um, so, in terms of the languages, of course, it seems like a given that you get better in your working language, right? It would be good if your English is good, if that's the language that you use to communicate to people, or if your Spanish is good, or if your Nepali is good. Um, now, the, the next question is, um, both about the language that you're studying, the local language, there's different views on this. In general, of course, a lot of people are often very excited about you learning their language because they never thought of it. But that is not always the case. Sometimes they see it as a threat um, that you're learning their language. And sometimes it might just not be appropriate for various other reasons. So I put some references there if you want to know more about this. So do check the cultural and social historical setting of the language before you decide that your goal is to become fluent and broadcast that to the world. I mean, obviously you want to learn something about the language, but maybe it's okay to not be fluent. And maybe it's okay also to not tell that to them um, so they can have their private conversations, et cetera. Um, think about the data that you need specifically and what that might look like. So um, that is if you have to make choices, which you often do when it comes to learning languages, um, focus on the things that you actually really need to know. Um, and if there is nothing, then learn from typological tendencies in other languages. Now there's elicitation. Of course, this is a, a popular way of getting data. So how do you get people to say something that you need, let's say? Um, of course, you need to find these materials beforehand. And you also need to check if they're appropriate locally. Like sometimes if you have, let's say, a storybook, maybe that's culturally inappropriate. So don't use that. So if there's nothing, create something new and then test the materials as well before you actually take it to the field and tweak it accordingly. 
So one thing I would I uh, do sometimes with my informants is I play Mastermind, which is from a paper by Silva and Anderba, because I don't know if you know this game, but it basically um, forces one person to talk about um, what they think or infer the next move is. And um, I'll just quickly show a video of how I did that. Um, here we go. Lena and Lena and Sina and a Sina, Ale Lena Roman and Sina and John Roman and Sina and Jumto, honest Tango Jumto. Okay, I hope you saw that. You probably could not understand what they were saying, but that's not the point. Um, so the point is that what he was saying is, well, I think that this the red one must be there because I got a clue that one of them was the right color, but not in the right position. Um, and the other one that he was saying is, well, I sort of assume that there must also be another color. So these things trigger different um, evidentials. And, and this particular language was kaike. So that's a language from Dolpo and other area I did field work. Um, so you need to also get some training in all of these tools that people use for, um, for field work. And I'll go through the tools um, when we actually get to that point, but here is just an overview to get as much training as possible. So try and seek training courses, for instance, through the ELDP um, or online. Um, make sure that you create and test your workflows, um, set up your metadata project, test your audio video conversions with all of the software that you need, like Handbrake, QuickTime, make sure that you know how to work with Audacity, that you know how to transcribe, etc. And we'll get back to these tools in a second. And the final thing you have to prepare is community. Um, so how to make contacts. Now making contacts, um, again, is something that you can probably ask your colleagues in any discipline. But be aware of possible, let's say, problematic fieldwork history in your local area. The sort of the, the SIL linguists have a very bad name globally because um, a lot of the time they're, it's associated with um, forced conversion to Christianity. And um, of course, it's not the case that all SAL people were like that, but the association there. <laughs> mm. <laughs> then you, you find informants who can, um, who can, <laughs> sorry, who can record. So the question here is, do you go for naive informants or expert informants? So there's different approaches here. Do you want to ask people who know nothing about language and linguistics? Or do you want to ask people who know something about language and linguistics? And you can get different results. Um, you, have, you have to find language workers, preferably people who can support you. And um, they're different from informants. So language workers can help you make contacts and find people to interview, etc. And maybe also help you with transcription if you need that. Um, and maybe you need to get access to some archives, or maybe you'd like them to perform some sort of ritual and get access to specific houses where they have collections. Now, all of these things you need to prepare in advance because it might take time to get access to these things. And then there's ethics, which you need to prepare. So there's a tension between ethics and let's say a desperate need to document and archive endangered languages in particular. Because usually when we do linguistic research, let's say if you think about psycho psycholinguistic experiments, there's a lot of emphasis on making sure that all your data is anonymous. But if we're trying to, let's say, do a video recording of someone speaking a language, obviously this is not going to be anonymous. And it cannot be anonymized 
like you can blur their faces and distort their voices, but it sort of defeats a lot of the purpose of trying to get good linguistic data for that language. So there's more risks here and you need to consider these risks and you need to consider the impact on the relevant community. Um, because confidentiality with videos is not really possible. I mean, as I said, it could be done, but it often defeats the purpose. So you need to get informed consent for non-anonymous recordings. And this requires some trouble with your ethics department at your university. So start this process um, well on time. Um, it also, um, you need to think about the informant's right to control access to any material that you archive. So do they want the material that you record to be open access, open to everyone, or maybe only to the selected users, or maybe only to you? Can you actually archive it or not? Now, if your grant stipulates that you archive everything, then obviously you need to get consent for all of these things, but you might want to consider different control options. Um, you need to think about what you pay them, if you pay them, if that is money or not, and if that is appropriate or not, there's various considerations. And you need to consider if they can benefit from your work as well and how they can benefit from your work. And again, if that is fair or not. So all of these things are very, very important. And if you want to read more, I put a lot of um, consider uh, references here. So how to do field work, the actual stuff now. So we'll quickly go back to the practical bit. Um, and basically the main thing with the travel and stay is be patient because nothing ever goes to plan. As I just said, um, basically the further you go away from your comforty house, the, the more difficult it gets. So be flexible to change your plans when the need arises but always check the risks so and the new budget and the new time limitations etc is it going am i going to lose a week for instance if i don't travel now um does that matter um and put your your safety and the safety and your mental health your health um and the health of the community uh, first that is always i think the first consideration over gathering any type of data of course um now budget some money. So again, update that budget and bring that banknote and then bring lots of cash to remote areas, but don't show it, right? So you don't want to be, oh, there's that white rich person that's bringing all this money, for instance, which is the case, you know, when I travel, I'm a white person, it's true, I'm a woman. So it's also in certain countries, like even worse to be a white like person and a woman traveling by herself. It's not great. So if you can, divide all that cash and hide it in multiple places, buy padlocks, money belts, anything that can put it safe. So don't show how rich you are. And this is also by not showing off your equipment unless you have to, right? You have to unpack it at some point, but you don't want to have a fancy new camera bag that shows that you got the best camera in the world. Like try and hide that if you can. Um, and the same with clothes. Uh, obviously, maybe you don't want to bring your fancy clothes to the field anyway, but do consider that. Um, um, and get receipts and take pictures for every receipt that you get immediately because you're going to lose your receipts. So um, take pictures of your receipts with your phone. Um, forms and health. So as I said, bring the printed forms and your vaccination cards. Um, have all the emergency details in your phone, but also on a separate, a separate laminated card and look after your own health while you're there. So really invest in good food and sleep, like choose that above anything else and take days off as well. It's not as if you, just because you're only there for three weeks, you need to work for three weeks. Like nobody can work for three weeks without any break. So do plan for days off. And it's normal to feel emotional, anxious, lonely, confused. Um, I've had that a lot when I was doing field work, especially um, when I was in a very remote area four years ago in Dolpo. Um, I was also like, I was fed some food that led to food poisoning. So I was very ill at some point. I was ill basically for two weeks. 
and I couldn't talk to anyone because I didn't speak the language yet and they didn't speak Nepali very well and they also didn't speak English at all. So then you get into a position where it's just you and you can't talk to anyone and that's not easy. So if you can't talk to anyone, then maybe you can write it down and that helps. Um, and maybe you just need to take a day off and say that you need to go to a place where you can have a phone call with someone you like. Um, that makes it a lot better. But um, I don't want to put you off. Fieldwork can be great, but I think it's it's okay to normalize that this happens and it's okay to acknowledge that because you can have bad days. And if you're very far from everyone you know and love, then that's difficult, but you can also get over that. And if you just acknowledge that, okay, this was a bad day, maybe tomorrow will be fine. And then you get on. Um, now, focusing on the linguistics, of course, um, we had we talked about workflows and how you plan that. So there's, let's say, the pre-session. You have a recording session, and we center everything around that. So there's a pre-session workflow, things you need to check, like, does my equipment still work after I put it on three different planes, et cetera? Um, do I have all my prompts, my elicitation questions, things that I wanted to ask? Did I bring my mastermind game, et cetera? Does everything still work? And do you have a plan for, you know, what, what if the, the speaker that you're going to interview said that he had lots of stories to tell and then after one sentence, it was quiet. <laughs> so think about what you can do then. Then during the session, you need a workflow. Um, you need to keep on monitoring how things are going. And uh, maybe you need to keep on asking questions. You need to listen very carefully as well. Even if you don't understand the language yet, just keep on listening. Try and take notes. Um, and then after the session, you need a separate workflow to back up all your data, convert it, process it, etc. So there's some people who've tried to put this in a nice flow chart. <laughs> um, now, this one is, I think, one of the best ones, and still it is quite confusing. But if you look at this, there's a planning session where you need to check your equipment, you need to gather your prompts and compile a to-do list. Um, during the session, you do the recording, you monitor it, you ask questions, you take notes. And then there's an awful lot, as you can see, after the session. So we'll get to that in detail. Now, there's various of these workflows around. You can build your own workflow, but you can use one of those as your templates. Now, for metadata, um, it's easiest if you just bring a ready template for, um, for this. So you can use the template that you like a form that you can get from a book, or you can just use a software like La Meta that has templates, and then you can just fill everything in very quickly when you're doing your session. It's important to add as much information as possible. So a unique um, ID for every session, um, a date, a time, a place, information about the speaker, information about the rights for that specific session. Like, is this going to be for all users or is this going to be specific? And um, what type is it? Is it a narrative? Is it, you know, a specific genre? Is it a conversation, etc.? And then you use La Meta or whatever other uh, metadata software you'd like to use uh, to standardize the formats. And you use Make sure that you have insightful file names and keep them for everything. And sometimes specific funders actually require specific names or specific archives require specific file names. So that's important. Um, right. So going to the community. Um, so this is about contacts, ethics, and local permissions again. So now we're in the community. And we need to be very much aware of any sort of ethnic and linguistic identity issues. Um, we want to make contacts locally as well, but we need to be respectful of any sort of social, cultural traditions. How do you greet people? Um, can you say no? In some cultures, it's very impolite to say no, but sometimes you really don't want to eat that or you really don't want to come in. Or <laughs> So how do you deal with that? Um, be fair with payments and meetings. Um, the example of staying with one family and paying them also goes for interviews. Maybe everyone in the community wants to do an interview, but do you have the money for that? 
um, is it maybe not appropriate to um, give them money at all? Sometimes they get very angry if you try and give them money. And what do you do then? Um, make friends if that's appropriate, but also be careful because you are still the linguist visiting and you always have to still be the linguist visiting. As soon as you go as a friend on holiday, it's a very different scenario and that can lead to problems. I've heard of people who um, did fieldwork in Kenya and made friends with people and they did a couple of sessions during the day and they paid them for the sessions and they agreed like we pay for each session this much. And then after the sessions were done, they went to the pub and um, they had a great time. And then at the end of the night, the informant said, OK, so that's another so many dollars because we talked again tonight, didn't we? And that's a very different setting from the like the linguist who thought in the afternoon we did the session and then we went to the pub. And yes, we chatted, but that was not the same for me. So um, make sure that all of that is very clear, even if you do become friends with people. But if you become friends, of course, it makes it a lot easier to find people to interview, to get the information, etc. Don't underestimate the importance of food and drink. A lot of things happen around food and drink um, and politely announce dietary requirements, but never say that you have some sort of preference. Like I never would say that I'm a vegetarian, even if I were a vegetarian, um, because in some cultures they don't understand that. Um, if they do understand it, it's fine. And then you can just say that you're a vegetarian. But if they don't understand that, then it comes across as rude because you're only sort of accepted maybe if you eat meat and have a bottle of local whatever it is that they made in their backyard. So it's very difficult to balance that. So it's always easier to say, well, you know, if I eat this, I'll get very ill, even if that's not quite true, maybe. Um, and then when you do the recording, make sure that people feel at ease when they're doing it. Maybe they've never sat in front of a camera before. So have a little conversation before them, before with them and um, try and make sure that they're comfortable. Now, ethics and local permissions while you're doing this field work. So you need to confirm your research permissions with local groups. And sometimes that's not the groups that you anticipated um, were in charge. So the first time I went to Nepal, I thought, okay, I'll have to ask maybe, you know, local governments or whoever rules, let's say if I want to interview a schoolmaster, I have to inter uh, ask the permission of the school. Um, but sometimes it's other groups. So in Nepal, in remote areas, it's actually not the local government that is in charge, but it's the youth clubs. So they're like local sports clubs and they rule everything. And if you don't get their consent, you have a big problem. And I can talk more about that in the question period. Um, so it's important to get, of course, um, informed consent before you start a session. Very, very important. So you can't do this after you've already recorded them. Um, make sure that you don't accidentally leave your recorder on after you finish your session, because that actually means that you're now collecting data illegally without consent. Um, also, always provide playback opportunities. So people like very often, especially um, when, you know, when there's people who don't have access to computers, etc., they find it interesting to look at, oh, this is us singing or this is us doing, you know, you can, they can see what they've done. And maybe they just want to see to check that what they said was all right. So that leads me to avoiding sensitive, personal, political, etc., topics, because there's a big likelihood that even though they gave consent beforehand, then they start talking and they get off topic. And then all of a sudden they talk about this local feud between two families and, oh, they realize, no, that's, that's not something that I wanted in my recording. <laughs> And if you don't speak the language yet, then you may not notice that they've gone off topic. And, you know, so it's sometimes it's very hard if you're not very fluent in the language yet to find out um, what they're talking about. And maybe you just need to make sure that that you you always ask questions to that are nothing to do with any personal, political, secret or restricted materials. Like don't try and get access to materials that once people have access to them will not be secret and sacred anymore. Um, and don't work with minors unless you have your DBS check and separate ethical approval, which is a whole another round of ethical approval beforehand, 
plus you need parental consent, etc. So that's a lot more difficult. Also be careful with linguistic activism, especially if it's political. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't support as linguists uh, efforts to, let's say, revitalize a language in a certain a minority language, for instance. But often these things can get very political. And it's nice if we can help, but it's not nice to be sent out of the country because you've, let's say, committed a political crime because you supported some groups. So I think it's good to be aware that these things can sometimes get very difficult. Of course, we'd like to help and share our expertise, um, but maybe that's not what you need to do right there, right then when you're in this remote area and you're quite vulnerable. Right, so technically then, um, equipment, going back to that, as soon as you, let's say, land in a country, get a local SIM card and maybe a local phone if your phone doesn't work there. Charge and check everything, as I said, and keep everything clean and dry. Bring like these little Salica bags that dry your equipment out. And also dry these Salica bags in like ovens every now and then. So they really keep your equipment dry. Um, try and record inside as much as possible because outside there's just too much background noise and sometimes too much light. And your camera lens will actually suffer if you point it at the sun. Um, do white balance checks for your video camera, et cetera. Make sure that during your session, your phone is turned off, their phone is turned off, so you're not disturbed. And use uh, microphones in the right way. So use a microphone stand because then you don't have, you have your hands free to do other things. Always have a 20 to 30 centimeters from the speaker. Listen with headphones to what the recording is like. And if you really have your, um, your double recording, et cetera, make sure that everything is working and never use phone activation. There's a lot of cameras and um, recorders that these days, like your phone, it's like, hey, Siri, can you record this? Um, don't do that because you will always lose the first 30, um, 30 sort of milliseconds of your recording. And that, that is very annoying. Um, use your camera in the right way. Again, use a tripod, charge your batteries. Cameras really Camera batteries don't last more than 60 minutes, maybe 90 minutes, good ones. So have a charging point or extra batteries with you. I try and have people in a dark background, no microphone in front of the hands, because if you want to record gestures and there's a microphone in front of it, then you can't record the gestures. Don't zoom in and out because it makes you really seasick when you actually watch the video afterwards, no matter how sort of interesting it may look while you're doing it. Um, so an example setup, um, so this is our friend and language worker, Kimmy, um, who we hired this summer to um, do the recordings for us, and he's from the local village, so, um, and um, he also has equipment which he got through one of previous our previous projects. So wherever you work, try and work with local people so you can also, you know, give them a job. And also try and work with um, what I did in this case, for instance, an anthropologist who has done field work in that area because they know already everyone in that area and I didn't know anyone. So even though they're not a linguist, you can still learn a lot and a lot of doors open. And then um, after you sort of obtain consent um, and you've picked the location, try and do the setup. So I'll show a little video that I made of how they were doing the setup. So this is our friend Kimmy here. And he's trying to set up the camera as you can see. Um, and um, he's now telling my colleague who's an anthropologist, Charles Ramble, to sit on the other side because it means that when he interviews people, when he starts asking questions, he can look them in the eye and they will look at the camera instead of looking sideways. So he's trying to make sure that we can do that entire setup. Okay. 
And the other reason we love working with him is because he could explain in the local language to every people we were working with what they could expect. So it was a lot easier for people to know what to expect. And um, so he's talking about keeping on talking, uh, what they can talk about, what they can't talk about, that they will be asked some questions, what he's going to do with the recording, etc. Basically, he can talk them through the, the whole consent procedure as well. As you can see, I'm not sure if you can see this uh, at the top here, he's also put some light. And as you can see, my recording here, which was just done with my phone to sort of as a meta recording of, of this whole setup procedure, is not great. But if you look at the actual video that he made um, of this session, so I hope you can see immediately that the lighting is a lot better. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have a very dark background, so we had to do it with this, but you can at least see their faces. So this the purpose of this session was to um well basically record people in conversation. Um it, unfortunately we couldn't um sort of visit them at another time. Um so they were extremely busy because they had just killed this yak, and then you have to process the meat in the same day because otherwise it gets it goes off. Basically, so they couldn't stop, but it was an only opportunity for us to record. So we had to record them during their yak momo uh, making session. So there's a little bit, there's a lot going on, but we did get the data that we wanted. And sometimes you just have to sort of make the best out of what you can get, um, which is what we tried here. But I hope you can see that um, the two people who are doing most of the talking are now looking at the camera because of the way everyone is positioned, which is important. So then after you've done your recording, the final bits, how do you, let's say, first of all, you, you need to complete and expand your metadata um, because there's often very little time during your session. So um, complete it afterwards if you can't get it done. And also sometimes you learn more about the language. So you actually figure out maybe they're not speaking the same variety. Maybe there's different varieties. So maybe you need to add more to your metadata. And then you will have to do that consistently for all of your sessions, of course. Or maybe you don't know the exact age of people and you learn that afterwards. So always complete and expand on your metadata afterwards. And then how do you process uh, all these files? Well, first, the first thing you need to do is if you have a video file, they're usually in video files in HD or very large formats if they're not in HD. So you convert them with Handbrake to an ELAN web format which is MP4. So they're a lot smaller because otherwise you can't deal with these files. They're enormous and they will slow down your computer after you've got two on them. So you can't even have them on your computer. Um, then you um, combine and trim the files with, uh, for instance, something like QuickTime, which officially has an MOV format, but you can secretly change that to MP4. Um, because in, uh, it changed four years ago and it's now exactly the same format. So it's underlyingly MP4, but you do need to change the extension. You need to extract and export the WAV file because otherwise you can't see it. And I'll explain in a minute why that's important. And you need to create your ELAN or whatever you use to transcribe project. Um, so how do you, uh, so this is an example of Handbrake. As I said, you need to compress your very, very large input file um, into an MP4 file and Handbrake has this ELAN setting and you just need to tick this web optimized box. And then it turns into a format that is suitable for web archives. Um, so then you can, maybe you have bits in the end or in the, in the middle that you don't need so you can, combine files and trim files with QuickTime. Um, 
And so the easiest way of doing it, obviously, you can also use things like Movie Maker if you have a Mac or whatever the equivalent is on Windows. And then you need to extract the actual WAV file. And this is important because it will help you with segmentation. So you need to actually extract this wave thing um, and export it um, because MP3 doesn't have that. So how do you store things? Well, normally it's recorded on SD cards. So you need to move it from your SD card um, to uh, separate hard drives, keep them separate as well, at least two, and they need to be one or two terabyte at least. Um, and then you need to save all of the converted files in, a, in one folder as well, because that means that software like Elan or Seymour, et cetera, they can get all of that from one folder as long as they're consistently named. Um, also back up your computer whenever, wherever possible. So bring whatever hard drive you have to back up your computer regularly. And if consent is withdrawn, so very often what I do when I have present consent forms, I give them one month to withdraw their consent. Maybe they change their mind because of whatever reason. So you put your contact details on the consent form. If they withdraw their consent, you have to make sure that you delete all the data everywhere. And this never happened to me before, but you need to give them the opportunity to withdraw their consent. Then of course you need to deposit and archive it. So you consider um, things like my funder has told me that I need to um, archive it here. So that's just what your funder says, and then you need to do that. Um, if you um, have a free choice, then the things that you need to consider is that you don't uh, divert from what you told people you would do. So if you if they gave you permission to archive in Archive X, then you archive in Archive X and not somewhere else. You can't change that. You need to think beforehand about that archive and whether it's maintained and sustainable, what the access options and restrictions are. If you want to go for a regional one like Paradisec or for a global one like ELAR, or more general that doesn't just have linguistic data. So Paradisec, for instance, is for specifically for Pacific and regional uh, languages. Uh, ELAR is for any endangered language. Um, so in, I'm just going to talk about ELAR because I don't work in Pacific languages, so I don't know anything about that one. Um, but ELAR has some uh, advantages and disadvantages. Disadvantage. I think is that basically, I think you can only deposit if you are an ELDP grant holder. So you need to get their grant first before you can deposit with them. The advantages though are that it's very sustainable, um, it's maintained regularly and it's free to deposit if you get their grant. It's also free to use, but you have different options. So you have to be a user. So there's a sort of a one little, so even your informants in the village can become uh, users and get access to the data, but they need to fill in a little form and um, there's a little bit of control. So your data is not just open access, which can be a little bit difficult because it is videos. So I think this is a good um, alternative. There's also support available from people who work with ELAR to help you. And it's a good website that you can use as an official sort of deposit. Um, right. So um, linguistic things, then segmentation transcription, you can use Seymour, which is really easy, but only for Windows and Linux to do transcriptions, or Elan, which is a little bit more tricky. Um, it looks a bit older, but it has many more options. And you can segment utterances, or let's say other chunks that looks like, look like clauses. Um, and you can do that separately for each speaker. So you can also allow overlap if you have conversations. And then you transcribe in their usual orthography if that's available. Or if that's not available, you do it in quasi IPA or you create some new orthography. So just as a reminder, orthography here really means writing systems that are standardized with respect to graphemes, rules, conventions. And sometimes it's important for a language to get an orthography. And this also includes rules about word boundaries and capitalization, etc. So in Elon, you can do segmentation like this. So this is why it's important to get the WAV file because you see when people are silent. So it's very easy to have your boundary here 
and here, etc. You can have multiple tiers, speaker one, speaker two. Um, this uh, was an awful lot of noise because this one was done outside, but we couldn't record inside because the women were not allowed to go inside during this part of the month. Um, then there's um, um, transcription. So uh, we had, uh, after desegmentation, you, uh, you create with templates in Elan, you create these text um, in the text bit to do your transcription. Very often what you do, what I do first is do sort of a rough transcription. And if I can't really understand it, um, then I just put some question marks and I get back to it or I ask my language informant to help me with it later. And then you do the translation afterwards or you can do it at the same time. Um, and then the question, of course, is, as you see, I didn't transcribe in IPA, um, but there are advantages of using IPA because you don't need to invent an orthography and it is the most accurate representation of actual sounds. But the disadvantage is that the sound quality may not allow for that amount of detail, which is very often the case. Even if you do your best to get very good microphones, um, it is also very time consuming because nobody, whatever they say, types fluently in IPA. So it takes an enormous amount of time. And it's very difficult to read and write for some people at least, <laughs> um, me including as well. So it's not quite as easy and straightforward. And most of the time you need an additional transcription than anyway, if you have IPA. So there's sort of advantages and disadvantages. And we in the end went for the orthography development because the local community also asked us for it. Um, and they asked our help with it. And then there's a couple of factors to consider like the linguistic ones, like are there phonological contrasts that I need to do, yes or no. For instance, let's say final devoicing is very often something that happens in languages, but is very often not written, like in languages like uh, German or Dutch. Prosody, do you indicate that or not? Are there any morphophonological processes that you want to indicate or not in your spelling? Is there a variation? Then there's pedagogical factors, like how easy is it for native speakers to learn the new orthography? And how easy is it for non-native speakers to learn the new orthography? Um, psychological um, factors, like how readable is it? We often read texts because of site vocabulary and is the orthography that you're designing suited to that or not? Also technological factors like ease of use, is it Unicode friendly or not? Social cultural factors, like are there already orthographies in the region? And is that a reason to use them or is that a reason to avoid them? Because both can be the case. And are they suitable for the language that you're working with? Because the languages may not be suited to that particular type of orthography. And then there are political issues. Like in Nepal, if you have a lipi or an orthography, um, it actually means that your ethnic group suddenly has status because you're actually an ethnic group because you have a language with an orthography. Um, so that then immediately brings a lot of pressure for certain groups to create an orthography. So there's a lot of considerations there. Um, one consideration that we had, um, just to give an example of a linguistic one, is that for instance, in terms of word boundaries, in Old and Classical Tibetan, we have genitive suffixes that have all these variants, but they're very sort of systematic. But then in modern Nomi, which is a language that is derived from Classical Tibetan, these genitive suffixes have sort of been reduced to ki, e, or e umlaut. So there's a vowel change. But that means that we can't actually have, let's say, just ki as a separate word and gi as a separate word and gi as a separate word, because now a word like father is papa, but a word like my um, of father, like father's apostrophe s, father's house is pape. So if we, we can't have that as a separate word anymore, maybe we can, but then we actually break up the word. Um, so how do you do your morpheme boundaries? And you need to think about that because Sometimes it would be nice for us, for instance, from a historical perspective to have the same rules in our annotation, but that's not always possible. Um, 
So yes, this, these are challenging issues. And then of course, one thing we really like is to not worry about transcription at all, but to just do it automatically because our phones can automatically transcribe us and the Zoom meeting can be automatically transcribed. So why can't we do that with our nice exotic language, let's say. Now, automatic speech recognition or ASR is actually getting increasingly better at low resource languages. Um, and there's one option that has a graphic user interface and that's ELPIS. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, um, ELPIS is basically using underlying systems like Kaldi and waf 2 fec um, that you can use yourself as well if you're better at coding. Um, so I'll just show you the examples because there's no point in showing you code, I think, but I can show you the user interface uh, version of these things. So Alpes runs uh, can run on your computer or on Google Cloud. And um, once you've installed it, basically you get the option to either start training a model or to transcribe audio. Now, before you transcribe anything, you need to train a model. So you go for that option first. And then what you do is you upload files, um, like some transcribed files, and you also need to upload a letter to sound file that says basically, if I hear A, ah, then I transcribe this as you know whatever grapheme you want to use for A, ah, for the sound A. Ah. So you need to have a letter to sound file if you have the Kali option. And then what it does, it uses a machine learning um, using sort of existing um, data and um, at least 60 minutes, I would say, of transcribed language specific data in Elan to train your model. And then Kaldi requires a letter to sound file and actually requires a lot more language specific transcribed data. The waf 2 vec option doesn't require a letter to sound file because it uses everything else there is in the world. <laughs> um, so it's really effective, but it really only works if you do have GPU access. Um, but it is very effective. And I even got some results for Kaike with just 35 minutes of transcribed data. It's not perfect results, but you know, as soon as you then start adding more specific data, it will get a lot better. So I do think that this will definitely help us in the future. So then finally, you need your fieldwork annotation, of course. So you need to consider your file format and workflow again and your annotation manuals. Well, I talked a lot about that last time, so I'm not going to repeat it, but what you need to think about is how you integrate your modern stuff with your historical stuff. And then you need to think about, is it worthwhile, for instance, to, cre uh, to create toolbox or flex databases, which are the typical formats that are used for fieldwork, in addition to what you've been doing for your historical pipeline, or are you just going to integrate this into your historical pipeline? So Toolbox, for instance, is uh, from the SIL. It's free. All the software that I'm talking about here is free. I don't recommend any paid software. Um, so Toolbox uh, can do, let's say, annotation, glossing, as you can see. Um, so there's quite a lot you can do with this. And then there's Flex as well, which is the Fieldworks Language Explorer. So it's sort of the XML version of this. Um, and it, it sort of, it can do things as soon as you have, let's say, a morphological analysis of something, then it can automatically annotate all of your genetics if it recognizes it, et cetera. So there is some gain from that. And then you can um, import it back into Elan, and then it, you have your, not just your transcription, but also your glosses. So maybe you can do a sort of a back and forth a workflow if you need that. But it does go back to the annotation that you need and the annotation puzzle and sometimes, so one thing that we're thinking about now is instead of using Flex and Elan is to just go back to the memory-based tagger that I mentioned last time, because that was good with zero information. And this is exactly what we have now, zero information. So um, we may just use this and just do put it through the same workflow. So with that, we can now actually see and understand a lot more if we have both our historical side very well annotated and we have our fieldwork side. Um, and with all of these things together, we can actually try and get more information about the history of our specific language and uh, our historical written sources and about uh, language in general. So the next lecture 
what we'll focus on is answering the diachronic research questions that we have, combining both of these um, both uh, of these fields, so the fieldwork data and the annotation of historical texts. And we'll do some ca uh, case studies of Celtic and Tibetan next time. So that's it. Thank you very much. Let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>